All right, I finished my general announcements, the highlights of which the crossword, vocabulary crossword is dead today. The section 4.2 homework is due today, dead on Tuesday next week. And the 4.2 take-home quiz is due today, dead on Monday. Okay, because I want to pass that back on Tuesday. All right. Now, before I get to the actual lesson, there is one slide that I wanted to share with you all. As a reminder, I told you before to complete three pages of independent reading in your note packet. If for whatever reason you haven't done this already, make sure you get it done by Monday because we're only going to be in 4.3 for two days, today and Monday. That's it. It's a really short section in your textbook. Okay, There are two major concepts that I want to touch on. So again, read through these three pages. One page shows you a good example of an experimental design drawing. Okay, And the other page actually gets into what we're going to into today. So the primary thing that I want to focus on today is the concept of statistical significance and what is meant by that. Now, I shared with you all a slide similar to this in the past, but I wanted to go through this one more time because the first problem we're going to look at today, while it starts with just sort of a let's read the problem and understand what the heck we're looking at type of thing, the very next question on the page deals with statistical significance. So I want to, and that's sort of the uh, theme for today. So I wanted to just highlight that for a little bit. So I actually, to know how fair how a fair coin behaves, I conducted a 100 trial simulation of flipping a coin 100 times. I literally just went into Excel, told it to flip a coin 100 times, and write down how many heads it got as a result of those 100 flips. And then I recorded that as a dot on this display. And then I repeated that 100 times. So every one of these dots represents the number of heads I got in flipping a coin 100 times. So this dot literally means in one of my 100 trials, I flipped a coin 100 times and got 51 heads. Okay, so you can see of the 100 trials, the lowest number of heads I got on any one particular trial was 33. That is very much unusually low, by the way. And one of the highest ones I got was 63, okay, which is unusually high. Okay, but what you're looking at is a display, a dot plot that basically says, if you are flipping a fair coin, this is how you can expect it to behave. There are certain features that should not shock you. For example, this display is centered on 50%, because if it is a fair coin, half the time it should be lower, half the time it should be higher. So it shouldn't shock us that that is the approximate center. Okay, the other thing being displayed here is what's called sampling variation, or natural variation, or what any common person might just call random chance. Even if it's a fair coin, that doesn't mean you're going to get 50 every time. You will produce results that are lower. You will produce results that are higher. Okay, so the idea is you can collect data like this or simulate data like this to get an idea of how a fair coin behaves. That way, if you wonder if a coin is fair, you can go ahead and flip it 100 times and compare what you got to what this display says should happen if the coin is fair. Now, if you get something like 46 heads, so you're if you're one of those dots, or if you get 56 heads, you're one of those dots, what I would say is that neither of those is statistically significant. And here's what I mean by that. According to our own display, even a fair coin will produce results as low as 46 or lower a lot. I don't know how many dots I just circled, but it's got to be at least 20. Okay, So what that should be is that even if the coin you're testing is a fair coin, it's going to produce results that unusual or more unusual a lot, 20% of the time or more, however many dots that is. Now, if you pick up a coin and you get 56 heads, at least according to these simulated results, that's only going to happen three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times out of 100. So it's a little more unusual to see something as high as 56 or higher than it is to see something as low as 46 or lower, which even that shouldn't shock you because 46 is only four away, 56 is six away. Okay, But if you pick up a coin and you're like, hey, I wonder if this is fair, and you flip it and you get 56 heads, your reaction should not be, okay, it seems like it's biased. Instead, your reaction should be, all right, well, even a fair coin is going to do that 9% of the time, so I'm not really impressed by these results. They're not rare enough. Okay, now, the natural question to what I just said is, what is rare enough? We're going to go back to something we talked about in the beginning of the year, less than 5%. So if you observe something that would occur by chance less than 5% of the time, 
then as statisticians, we tend to say, all right, well, we probably observe what we saw not just because of random chance, because random chance would only allow that to happen less than 5% of the time. Maybe it's actually indicative of the coin being biased. So for example, if you get 33 heads, which something that unusual literally happened one time out of 100, or maybe you get 62 heads, which something that unusual only occurred two times out of 100. Well, now your reaction could be, if you're on the low end, all right, it seems like this coin is biased against heads. It's not producing enough heads. Because a fair coin would almost never do that. It would do it 1% of the time by chance. So that is statistically significant. It shows results that would not happen often enough by chance. And so it's statistically significant. That's the idea. Okay, so that is sort of the theme of the two problems I'm going to try to look at with you all today. Questions? Yes. Okay, so this is the context we're going to deal with with the first problem today. So the idea is you're dealing with a scenario where if doctors are in no way scheduling C-sections to benefit themselves, and they're literally just allowing births to occur whenever they would occur, then what you would expect to see is that about 31 people out of 70 people would have been born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Now, the number is coming from the fact that we're trying to target people that are born on either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, that's three days out of seven days. That is where the 43% comes from. So what I want you to imagine in this simulation is we have a coin that is set to 43%. So try to imagine that. You have a coin that is custom designed so that when you flip it, there's a 43% chance it's going to land on heads. Because in this scenario, again, there is a three out of seven chance that you should be born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Now, because we're dealing with a sample of 73 people, I'm going to pick up this coin and I'm going to flip it 73 times to represent each of those 73 people. And I'm going to look at those 73 flips and I'm going to ask myself how many of them landed on heads. Now, what I should expect is that percent of 73 or right around 31 will be heads. That's sort of our center. Kind of like in the example I showed you previously, our center is 50. Because for a fair coin, it should produce 50 out of 100 heads. Well, here, if the coin really is set to 43%, well, then we should have about 31 out of 73. So it's not a shock to me that this display is centered around 31. We good so far? Now, if that's truly the case, because a lot of you just nodded, the first question should be very straightforward to us. It says there are three dots at 36. Explain what one of these dots means in context. So remember, every one of these dots represents a simulated group of 73 people, and the value of represents the number born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Okay, So this is a simulated trial that resulted in 36 of the 73 people born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Now I'm going to explain this display in a slightly different way, just so that we can hear it from multiple angles. Again, the theory is, let's pretend doctors are doing nothing to control when children are being born. If that's true, then births should occur uniformly across all days. So about 13% of kids should be born on every single day of the week. Which means, if you're going to target Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, that's the percentage you should see. Now, if this is the case, if I hired every one of you, go out into the world, get your own simple random sample of people, just ask them, when were they born and figure out what day of the week that was, okay? And then record it and let me know how many of your 73 people were born on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. That would be another way of getting this. Sort of like every one of these dots was one of you who went out and got a sample of 73 people. Now, the reason I try to stress that is because even though we expect, like my expectation is you're going to come back and say, I had about 31 people that were born on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Now, some of you might observe way lower. You might come back and say 22. If you came back and said seven, I might think you did something wrong. Okay. And if you came back and said, well, all 73 of them were born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, it's not impossible for that to happen, but that would be highly sus suspicious. Does that make sense? 
because you should have gotten your sample randomly. So all of that is to say, explain how the graph illustrates the concept of sampling variability. So the simulation assumes you should get 43%. So the simulation assumes you should get 31. Well, we don't get 31 every single time. That's sampling variability. Okay, the idea that the simulation results vary from 43% of people, okay, which is about 31 out of 73 people, born on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's the concept of sampling variability. You're supposed to land around 31, which would be about 43%. You don't always land there. Sometimes you land higher, sometimes you land lower. All right. Now we're going to segue back into statistical significance, which is the main reason you would do something like this. The whole point of this display is to tell you, okay, if it's really true that doctors aren't doing anything, then when you go out and look at 73 people, these are the kinds of results you should expect to see. Okay? So then we're being asked, based on the data from the study and the results of the simulation, is there convincing evidence that fewer than 43% of people born since 1993 were born on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday? In other words, when this teacher actually went out, when Miss McDonald actually went out and got a sample of 73, only 26 of them were born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. That's not 43%. It's less. They observed only 35%. This is similar to you flip a coin that you suspect is fair, and you don't get 50%. You get something lower. The question is, was it reasonably lower? Hey, where's my dots? There we go. Is it reasonably lower? Or was it extremely lower? Does that make sense? And the way you you know, draw that line is you ask yourself, the thing that happened, would it have happened less than 5% of the time? Okay? So... We basically want to know this. Is our observed sample of 26 out of 73 born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday rare or unusual? So I'm going to go back to the display. And now I'm asking you all this. How many times, if doctors really are doing, doing nothing, because that's what this display is about, when you go and get 73 people, how often might you observe 26 or fewer? How many times does that happen? It happened 12 times. If you count up all the dots that occurred 26 or less, there are 12 of them. So what that's saying to you is, if doctors really are doing nothing, then when you go out and talk to 73 people, there is a roughly 12% chance you will observe 26 or fewer people. In other words, it's part of the orange. It's, yeah, it's lower than 50%, but it's not really convincingly lower. It's just sort of something that would happen by chance. Okay? So... This, I should say this, this is not statistic. Oh, there. Oh, it is there. Oh, good. It's not a typo. There is not statistically significant evidence fewer than 43% of people born since 1993 were born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Okay? Because our simulation had 26 or se out of 73 or fewer 12% of the time. And that 12% is greater than 5%. All right, last question on this particular problem before we switch context. It says, based on the... Re oh, two more questions. Based on the results of the simulation, how many people in a random sample of 73 would you have to observe were born on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday in order to have statistically significant evidence to be convinced the percentage of people born on those days has dropped? So in other words, how low do you need to go? At what point, let's go back to our simulation results, how far down do we need to go so that I can finally say, all right, well, the probability of landing there or lower is less than 5%. Can anybody see that number? What, where do you need to stand on this display so that at you and below occurred less than 5% of the time? The pro that's the problem. I don't know if you're which direction you want me to read the number. So what number are you referring to? 23. Okay. 23 is our line. The reason 23 is our line is because if you go out and get a sample of 73 people and only 23 of them were born on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, well, according to our own results, the probability of seeing 23 or fewer 
only happen three times. That's 3% of the time. Now, if I had gone just one number over to the right and started at 24, how many dots is that? Six. So our simulated results say the probability of landing at 24 or less is 6%. So it's starting with that line, but it's not clear. Okay. So our answer to part D here, again, we're just looking for something that is so happen less than 5% of the time. So observing 23 of the 75 or fewer for an on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday would convince me because this happened. 3% of the time, meaning less than 5% in the simulation. Okay, and then I just have a green note mentioning that if you stood at 24, that wasn't quite rare enough. All right, in the interest of time, given that we have a shortened period, I'm going to, you know, kind of go through the last one very quickly. It says, if the simulation had used 400 simple random samples rather than 100, how would you expect the display to change? So the idea is, we ran 100 trials, or Ms. McDonald ran 100 trials, and we ended up with this display. If she instead ran 400 trials, that would have no impact on the center of the display. You still expect around 31. You would just have four times as much data. Does that make sense? So I would imagine the height of all the bars would basically be about four times larger, but also because you're conducting 400 trials and not only 100, it's easier to get some of the more extreme outcomes. So you might end up with a couple trials that reach down below 22 or a couple trials that reach up above 440. Does that make sense? Like you might get a few more of the slightly more rare outcomes. So that's essentially what I said. I would expect each bin to have about four times as much data and new bins containing slightly rarer observations. So observations below 22 and or above 40. All right, go ahead and turn the page, folks. All right, so the first two pieces of this, uh, one is actually something we're going to look at in the next chapter at in greater detail. Uh, the, the first part is something you actually had to do on your 4.2 quiz. So I'm going to, I don't want to spend my shortened period here on this, but I'm going to read the context, reveal the answers, and move on to the real thing, because statistical significance is the real thing I want to focus on today. Okay, so I'm trying to save some time where I can. It says, does fish oil affect blood pressure? To see if fish oil can help reduce blood pressure, males with high blood pressure were recruited and randomly assigned to different treatments. Seven of the men were randomly assigned to a four-week diet that included fish oil. Seven other men were assigned to a four-week diet that included a mixture of oils that approximated the types of fat in a typical diet. At the end of the four weeks, each volunteer's blood pressure was measured again and the reduction in diastolic diastolic blood pressure was, rec was recorded. So again, I'm not looking to give you time to copy this down now. Get it on your own time. But if you're going to draw a completely randomized design, you start with the 14 men. You randomly assign them to two separate groups. One gets fish oil, one gets a mixture of oil, and then you compare blood pressure. Now, with describing a random process... I feel like an elementary teacher every time I reveal this, but trust me when I say, for whatever reason, this is a favorite method of people that grade the AP exam. I don't really get why they're obsessed with names and hats, but they are. So describe a random process that could be used to assign these men. Put all 14 names on identical pieces of paper, put them in a hat and mix them, pick seven at random. Those seven men get fish oil, the other seven get the other thing. Got it? I'm not giving you time to copy it because, again, I'm trying to save time. The main thing that I want to focus on is on the next page, because this gets into the new concept for today, which is statistical significance. Recall, the reduction in diastolic blood pressure was recorded. The observed differences are listed below. Note, a negative value means a blood pressure increase. Okay, so you'll notice, for the men who were assigned fish oil, every one of those numbers is positive, which means every, well, except for the zeros, every one of them experience a drop in blood pressure. For the mixture group, you do have a zero, but you also have a couple negative values. That actually represents men whose blood pressure reduction was negative, which means their blood pressure went up. Does that make sense? Okay, so positive is a good thing. That means your blood pressure went down. Negative is a bad thing. It actually went up. Calculate the observed mean reduction. So this is the only thing, this and the next thing are the only things that a calculator could possibly be needed for today. Essentially, notice you can just copy the blue. You would take all the values for the fish oil group, 
add them up, divide by the seven men that there were, you get an average drop in blood pressure of 6.571. Then for the mixture oil group, you get an average increase in blood pressure, actually, of 1.143. So these are the observed reduction in blood pressure. Again, a negative reduction means, on average, they went up. Now, you're then asked to calculate the observed difference in mean reduction. So I'm just going to subtract those two values. Keep in mind that you are subtracting a negative, so you end up with a larger number than either value, which hopefully makes sense to us. One group is over here at positive 6.5. The other group is down here at negative 1.1. And so the two groups are 7.7 .7 apart. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Now, here's the punchline. 100 trials of a simulation were performed to see what differences in means are likely to occur due only to chance variation in the random assignment, assuming that the type of oil doesn't matter. Use the results of the simulation below to determine if the difference in means from Part B is statistically significant. Explain your reasoning. There's a lot going on here to try to wrap your head around. So let me first make sure we all understand what a dot represents and what's going on here. The idea is we're going to run a simulation where fish oil and mixture are no different. They have the exact same impact on blood reduction. So I'm going to simulate. I've got seven guys that are going to get fish oil. I've got seven other guys that are going to get mixture. Now I'm assuming these two things have the same effect on blood pressure. So I'm assuming, gentlemen, that the difference would be zero. So it makes sense, first of all, that this display would be centered on zero because you're assuming there's no difference. And so your simulated results of the types of differences you might see should be centered on zero. We still good? Now, what we actually observed was a difference of positive 7.714. Now, let's be clear. If, let's pretend, this number had been 1.7, then I would go to my display and I'd say, well, when I simulated to see what kinds of differences might occur, I saw something around 1.7 or more a lot. Do you see that? So my reaction would be, that's not really statistically significant. Like, yeah, the, the fish oil group had a better reduction by 1.7, but you're going to see differences of 1.7 all the time just by chance. So that doesn't really prove that fish oil is better. That doesn't even suggest, I should say, that fish oil is better. However, we saw a difference of 7.7. .7, and that type of difference in our simulated trials only occurred twice. So if there truly is no difference between fish oil and, and the oil mixture, well, then you almost never should see differences like this. In other words, almost never 2% of the time. So is that observed difference statistically significant? Yes or no? Yes. If you can't say yes there, then you need to be concerned about how much sense today made, made to you. Okay. So a mean difference of 7.714 or greater only occurred 2%, which is less than 5% of the time in our simulation. So it is statistically significant. I wish I had put something in the question that would force us to write the part in green. You know, like write a conclusion. What does this actually mean? Or talk about the scope of your data. Okay. But the green just says, therefore, it does seem the fish oil is more effective at reducing blood pressure than the mixture of oils. And we're done. Thank you for your time, folks. I know we went pretty fast there, but I was trying to work with that shortened period. All right. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.